20 tonight. I really enjoyed uh, last, the time or two weeks ago, the input, the, the dialogue that was spoken by everybody was wonderful. Really, that's how I want Bible study to be presented. I want it to be that we can ask questions. I want it to be that you can present as well. You may have something that I have not thought about. Um, you know, I, I may not have looked at it the way that you look at it. And uh, as I'm looking at study uh, guides and uh, commentators, you know, looking at different ones, it still can be different things that, that even they don't present. So uh, uh, I want Bible study. I want you to walk away feeling refreshed and learned and knowing that the Spirit of God has touched you. And there's something that you can take home with you that will be a blessing for you. We should be finding that in the Word of God. Amen. We need that. I don't want us running on empty or yesterday's blessings, but I want us to find something fresh and new. So, uh, John chapter number 20 tonight. I'm not going to read the beginning part of this. I'm just going to share a few things that I haven't looked at so, so much in, in the fact of Mary Magdalene. At the first day of the week coming to the sepulcher, remember it's dark. Remember she is coming. This is the woman who has broke the alabaster box. She has given wholeheartedly to Jesus. And even though it was so expensive, the only regret that she had is that she did not have more to give. And so she comes with spices. She comes with things that she wants to put on the body of Jesus. She wants him to be well taken care of. Once again, she has spent. Uh, any of our, anything that we spend for Christ is worthwhile. Uh, we can never outdo Christ. We can never outspend Christ. And so in our, in our time and in our effort, the things that we give to Christ, the only regret that we'll have when life's final breath is breathed, breath breathed is that we did not have more to give and we did not do more. And so Mary Magdalene, the Bible says that uh, uh, the first day of the week, very early in the morning, there was no procrastination. She came, and we see that Mary, she has consistency, and she has fervency. She is seeking the Savior. She is looking for a risen. Uh, she doesn't know that He's risen, but she's coming to look for the one who's changed her life. She's been delivered from what she was, and now has been set to freedom to what Christ wants her to be. And so there's consistency and fervency. When we've been set free by the power of Jesus Christ, there should be consistency and fervency in our life. Let me just stop here. You know, when folks ask me, how is someone doing? Or, uh, or, or folks ask me, well, what do you think about uh, 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 church attendance? or what? Uh, you know, it's very difficult when, when I know that uh, someone has once served the Lord with fervency, Faithful to the Lord's house all the time. And then there becomes an inconsistency. It's a struggle for me to wonder where someone's heart and soul is in the Lord. Or you see someone who has uh, served the Lord in a capacity of yielding their best soul and everything to God. And, and, and they once exemplified holiness. And now they no longer do that. I have to say this. There's a brokenness in their consistency and fervency, and there certainly is, uh, uh, for, for, for uh, in accordance to God's Word, there certainly is warrant for concern. So here it is that Mary, she's fervent, she's consistent. So I, I, I appreciate that. Peter and John, they're gone. Uh, they, they, uh, uh, they were there, uh, uh, but, but she states... True love will have an adherence to Jesus Christ. I think Mary is exemplifying true love to a Savior, and there is an adherence that she has to Jesus Christ. Uh, she, uh, she has a true heart from Him, and it bursts a desire for a knowledge of knowing where is He at. Let me just say that again, because I want it to sink in. She has a true heart for God, and because she has a true heart for God, it bursts a desire for knowledge of knowing where Jesus is at. When we have a heart for God, it should birth a knowledge of knowing where Christ is at. God, where are you at in my life, and what are you up to? 
God, where are you leading me? And what are you teaching me? And where are you at in the situation? When we come to church, God, where are you at in the service? God, what is your plan for the service? What is your plan for my life individually? What is your plan for, for us collectively? God, where are you? Because when we have a heart and a love for Christ, it will birth a, a desire for a greater knowledge of Him. Oh, I want to know Him. Oh, I want to know Him. I want to see Him. I want to please Him. Amen. So when we have that heart for Christ, as, as Mary Magdalene did, it bursts a, a desire for knowledge. <coughs> she, uh... Let me see if I can read my handwriting here. Uh, she, she loves Him. She cares. Uh, uh, those... Uh, uh, that she, she's there, she wants to find him, and even though she is crying and, and she is weeping, she is weeping because she wants to find him. She's lost him. Where is he at? Where is Jesus at? I know that he was placed in the tomb. I saw him come down from the cross. I watched him as they took his broken body down. I watched him as they laid him in the bar tomb. I watched as they rolled the stone. I watched as they put the seal around about it. But where is he at? She weeps bitterly till, till she can find him. Let me ask you in your life, and challenge in my life, if we lose Christ in the middle of life, if we lose Him in the middle of, uh, of where we are, how do we respond? I think Mary Magdalene exemplifies how we should respond. We should weep bitterly until we find Him. Amen. If the things of God are no longer fervent and, and no longer a primary in our life, if we don't know where He is in the middle of life, in the middle of our relationship with Him, in the middle of serving Him, if we've got our eyes off of Him, and it easily happens, hey, the devil will distract you. The devil will try to get you off track. Life is busy. We are occupied until it comes. And sometimes in occupied, we get our eyes off of Jesus. We lose Him. The desire to please Him more than anything. The desire to love Him. The desire to be holy. So what do we do when we've lost Christ? Mary's example is this. That we should weep bitterly till we find Him. A better repentance with tears. God, I'm sorry. I must find you. And she looks her heart because it loves Christ so much causes her eyes to look. So there's this of the internal, the emotional, the spiritual part of her that causes her physical to look for Christ. I believe that that's why we're here tonight. Because internally, our hearts want to find Christ. We want to find Him in the middle of life. We want to find the power of God's Spirit, the Holy Ghost in our life. So because we are internally driven, it affects us physically that we prepare ourselves when we come to church and we are here because we want to find Christ. But the important thing to, that we need to realize is that weeping didn't even stop her from finding Christ. <clears throat> Seeing angels didn't stop her from finding Christ. Even the number of them, even the word of them, even the glory of them did not stop her from seeking Christ. Listen, even though we're here in church tonight on a Tuesday evening, uh, I'll tell you, sometimes it's easy to be distracted. There's things that happen. There's things at home. You know, even for me, I'm, you know, uh, tonight, even during song service, I'm trying to help my wife and keep an eye on two little ones. can be distracting. You know, maybe they can even distract you. We don't want them to. Uh, but, you know, things can distract us. You know, uh, uh, a, a cell phone vibrating can distract us. Uh, just various things can distract us. But I, I want to say that a real heart that's attentive for finding Christ, nothing will distract them from finding Him. Not even the glory of angels or the words of angels. Not even your own grief. <clears throat> and so Jesus, and I did say this last time, but this is the one thing that I found that is noteworthy that I want to say uh, tonight. You know, when Jesus uh, didn't, 
he was there. And Mary was supposing that, um, that, that, that he was a gardener hired by Joseph of Arimathea. Remember this? Remember that we know that there must be a garden close to Calvary. And John is the only one that presents that there is a garden here. Imagine what it's like. Even our cemeteries are much like that. We may take artificial flowers, but if you look at some older cemeteries, they're very arrayed by the bushes and, and, and flowers. I mean, it was, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful, restful place for the person that we love and for us as we comfort ourselves. So here it is, the beautiful place. Perhaps Joseph of Arimathea has hired a gardener, and uh, she looks and she sees Jesus, now, does he look different? Certainly different than the cross. He has a glorified body, but recognizable, obviously, because we see that by the disciples. But, but, but she, uh, she is so uh, not understanding that he is resurrected that she's looking for him. And so Jesus, he speaks to her, and he asks her, he says, Woman, why, why, why do you weep? Why weep a stop? And so... Uh, <coughs> He continues to say, whom do you seek? Because she supposed him to be the gardener. And she said, please just tell me where you put him. I want his body to have a proper, a proper burial, a proper place. I don't want him to be on a trite sheet somewhere. I don't want it to be disposed of improperly. I brought spices. Just tell me where you placed him. And so Jesus refers to her as a woman. And there's many women in the church here tonight. And so it's, it's kind of collectively he refers to her as a woman, dealing with her need, but dealing with her grief as well. And then we find that not only does he refer to her as a woman, uh, he then says unto her, Mary. He then speaks to her on a personal level. I love how God can collectively take care of the church, and He can take care of the world, and He can take care of many people, but my God is a personal God. He knows me by name, He knows my thoughts, He knows the hairs of my head, He knows every word that's in my tongue spoken or unspoken. He knows everything about me, He knows my beginning, He knows my end. He knows everywhere I've gone, but He also knows where I'm going, even though I don't always know that myself. He is a personal God. Tonight I want you to know that that is the greatest thing that you and I should experience. When we hear the gospel, it is given collectively, but there should be a relationship with Christ. Amen. That it is a personal relationship, a one-on-one -on -one with God. Thank God that He knows us in a personal way. Amen. Amen. That's the power of the resurrection. It meets people collectively, but it meets people personally. So, we had some conversation after, after service um, two weeks ago. I did not present everything because I didn't read a lot about it. I still haven't read a great deal about it because most commentators does not approach the subject uh, as much as, as others. We, we, we looked, and <clears throat> Jesus tells uh, Mary not to touch him, for he's not yet ascended to the Father. Now, I presented something, and I still probably stand more strongly by this presentation, because uh, there's, there's depth to it, uh, and, and that is... That, that is, uh, he said, don't touch me, in reference of, of really meaning, you, 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 you can't grab hold of me, and you can't keep me here. You know, if any of us saw any of our loved ones, it's funny, I just, yeah, hey, this is popping my mind, sorry. Yesterday, I was just talking uh, to someone, they said to me, you know, it's, it's, it's weird, my parents are gone. One of my parents has gone 17 years, and, and I still broke down and cried just last week because I missed them so much. Amen. And then uh, someone else uh, today in conversation said, you know, I really miss my parents. They've been gone for years. This person is up in their 70s. They said, they've been gone for years, but I really just miss my parents. You only get one set, and when they're gone, that's all you have. 
Uh, you know, and so I, I'm hearing this. And so, uh, you know, if we could grab hold of someone and say, no, I want to keep you here. You know, if it's our parent, if it's our loved one, whatever it is. If, if, if you saw them after you physically saw a, a layout of them and knew that they were gone, that they were they were deceased. Uh, if you could see them, uh, wouldn't you want to grab on to them? Sometimes our mind's an amazing thing. Even we can dream and, and maybe we see someone in our dream and it seems so vivid and real. And you wake up and realize. It's just a dream, but boy, if you could grab hold of that dream and bring it to reality, it would be wonderful. And so basically, I, I said all that to say this, that, 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 that Mary, you know, uh, she wanted to hold on to Jesus. Man, this is a woman who was possessed by devils and, and Christ delivered her. This is a, a woman who, who avidly loved the Savior and believed the message of the gospel that he presented. It gave her hope. It gave her peace. It gave her life. Uh, I mean, she loved Jesus. Uh, this was her master. She wanted to hold on to him. Also, she was going to go and she was going to tell the disciples that he was resurrected. Now, remember what happened on, uh, 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 on that triumphant entry into Jerusalem? They misunderstood Jesus. They thought that he was coming to build this po uh, po political government. And they wanted him to overtake and give us a government and a kingdom where which there, would, there would be no end. It would be a kingdom of peace and righteousness. And the, well... Their disciples would want that too. Um, we want to hold on to you. Build your kingdom. Stay. Do it now. But Jesus was saying, do not touch me. And so many folks <coughs> feel it was in the context of what I just presented. Now, however, there is some thoughts and some feel and believe that, you know, in, uh, he'll, he'll appear in the evening and then before he appears under Thomas, it's eight days. So some feel that there was an ascension to the Father in which he presented himself, and then he was able to be touched. So, once again, I don't think, for me, uh, I look, I think, well, that's a possibility. You know, all that's possible. Not worth splitting hairs over. Uh, but certainly is something that I want to present because there is time lapse uh, in, in which we know that he does present himself a little later. We'll talk about that in a few moments. However, we don't see of him being touched um, in that presentation to some of the disciples. But even when he comes to Thomas, we don't really see him Thomas touching him, although he said he would. We don't really see that in fruition. Um, but we see that he sees and he believes. And so that is very important for us to look at. Now, what did, what did Jesus tell his disciples? I think this is noteworthy. This is very noteworthy here. Jesus, he says uh, to her, don't touch me, uh, uh, touch me not, for I'm not yet ascended to my Father. By the way, thank you for those who did make that presentation to me two weeks ago because I didn't read about that, but ran, read over it quickly and did not present that. So I do want to present that. I want to present all sides, and so it's very good to present. And uh, so uh, the Bible says, For I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them. Now let's just stop there. Who's he speaking of? Go to my brethren. His disciples. Brother Eli, he gives a presentation of something that we've not yet seen, but because of the power of the cross, of the blood of Jesus Christ, and the victory of the resurrection, he doesn't refer to him as disciples, Brother Justin, but he refers to him as brother. Now are they part of the family of God. I asked you my, uh, my brother my brother-in-law last week for, for a few hours. And uh, he was sharing with me that uh, a few weeks ago they had preached a revival in California. And he said that uh, it was beautiful there. There was orchards and orchards. He said, we don't often think of this. He said, but there was a walnut orchard that we passed by, just miles and miles. He said there were some of the trees that were so white. Now, I could be getting this backwards. I'm just of, of what belongs to the white and the dark, but just for my illustration. 
He said the white, he said were just mild, mild. He said they were, you know, English walnuts. He said then you would pass by other trees. And Brother Dennis, they were black in their color. Uh, they were actually black walnuts and that were being grown there. And these, these orchards were there. And he said then, he said it was the strangest thing. He said we went by some orchards where the base of these trees were all black. But then the branches came up and they were as white as could be. He said, so I asked them what is going on. He said it was interesting because what they did was they took uh, the black walnut uh, that was at the base and then they grafted in the English walnut because they found that the root system on the black walnuts was much better. So even though it would produce the English walnuts, the root system was better for that tree to be grafted in. And as I read this, and I was preparing for tonight, I began to think about that. Brother Justin, my root system was not designed to go to heaven. There was nothing on my own that I could do to merit the kingdom of God. My root system would not allow me to go deep enough and be able to produce well enough to be able to make heaven my home. But because of Jesus Christ, I am now grafted in to the family of God. And because of the root system of Jesus Christ, I can now produce for the kingdom of God on this side of heaven because he has grafted me into him. Yes, I am his disciple, but I am his brother because I am part of the family of God that's been grafted in through the blood of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. That is wonderful tonight. And he said, I, I, I send unto my Father and your Father to my God and to your God. Once again, giving validation to the fact that he and man ascended in this next week. Uh, <clears throat> and he, he, he presents that uh, my Father is now your Father because of the work of the cross. My God, uh, 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 or yeah, my God is, is now your God because of the work of the cross. And Mary Magdalene came to the disciples uh, that she had, uh, 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 came and told the disciples that she had been with the Lord and what He had spoken unto her. Amen. What a great thing when we have an encounter with Jesus Christ, uh, we can't help but share it with others. Uh, Brother Doug, I don't think that. Uh, Jesus had to worry if Mary was going to pass this on to the brother and the disciples because Brother Eli, she had an encounter with Jesus Christ and it changed her. Amen. It's changed her before, but this resurrected encounter really changed her. And so she can't keep it to herself. The Bible says that, the, uh, that, 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 that same day at evening, uh, being the first day of the week, <coughs> when the doors... Uh, were shut. The disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. Why? Why do they have fear? What's the reason for fear? They come take this murder Jesus. Why wouldn't they murder these disciples, the followers? I mean, they have a hatred for this message and this gospel. So the best way to get rid of it is to annihilate those who preach it. And so they're in a room and they're together for fear. Uh, the Bible says uh, uh, that Jesus was in the midst of that. Once again, <coughs> he comes in the room, he stands. Uh, he doesn't need to knock on the door. He doesn't need someone to open it. He comes in and he said unto them, Peace be with you. See where I'm at in my notes. All right. Peace be with you. Amen. Jesus wants us, and what, what this peace be with you, in the, the deeper and even the more simplistic way for us to look at what Jesus is saying. He said, I want you to have fullness and happiness. You know, in serving Christ, there is fullness and there's happiness. That is what brings peace. And uh, the Bible says, uh, uh, especially during this time, you know, when you're going through those fearful moments of life, to be able to have Christ speak peace. Whatever it is, we all have those moments where there can be, uh, uh, the Word of God tells us to be anxious for nothing, but in our flesh, when we feel that, to be able to feel the Spirit of God, to bring that to pass, that we don't have to be anxious for nothing. 
diagnosis or what the outcomes may be, uh, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, our, there, there's a vast things, and I, I don't want to start going down the rabbit trail on things. And when he had said, uh, <clears throat> and when he had said so, he showed them his hands and his side. Listen, why do you think that he would have, have shown them his hands and his side? So he, he has this glorified body. I've kind of given you the answer there. He has this glorified body. And he shows them the scars that he has there. Why do you think that he would need to do that? He is Christ. It's not a spirit. It's not a spirit. But it is a resurrected, glorified body that he has. And so uh, it, 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 it proves that he is Christ. He is resurrected. Anyone can say what they want about someone being resurrected. But the validation comes as he presents himself to the disciples. We know he presented himself to the disciples uh, on various occasions. We'll talk about some more of them maybe tonight. We know he presents himself to over 500. So there's validation given that he has a body. It is a recognizable body that that is Christ. There is validation to that because he proves the power of the resurrection. And uh, I think that the thing that we, we need to understand, that he just spoke to them, that they, uh, peace be unto you, but he also presents to himself it presents himself to him uh, in, in his body. He, he presents showing that he is a resurrected Savior and that he is alive. Now let me bring that home to tonight. He tells, he tells Thomas, he said, Blessed are you because you have seen what you believe, but more blessed are they which believe and have not seen. We believe in the validation of him being alive. Because we, we, have, we have it in the written Word of God. Why would we de denounce the Word of God? We know that it is the living Word. It changes our life. It speaks to us. And so if there's anything that we ever need the peace of God because we are fearing, feeling fearful, I want you to put this in the back of your mind. I want you, if you're ever in a place that you're feeling fear and anxiety and you need the peace of God, how do I get it? I think Christ gave us the remedy here to understand that we serve a living Savior. And when we understand that we serve a living Savior, it will take away any fear. It will bring us to that place of fullness and happiness in Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. That no matter what we go through, that Christ is alive. There's no need to fear. We can experience peace because He's alive. Hallelujah. He is alive. He is alive forevermore. Amen. It brings peace. Amen. How will I get through this? Because Christ is alive. Amen. And how can I trust my family members to this? Because Christ is alive. Amen. And that will give us peace for our situation. Uh, no matter uh, what is going on, if we can bring to our mind the awareness that we serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living no matter what men say. Amen. He is alive and alive forevermore. It will bring peace to us. The Bible says in verse number 21, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so, even so send I you. So he said you can have peace in your anxiety. I know that you're fearful disciples right now, but I'm alive. Have peace. And he says to him, peace again, because he's about to commission them 
to go and share the gospel with others. Sister Tina, as you were saying, uh, you know, about your friend, and I don't know all the details about that, but being able to present the gospel, particularly to someone our, we love, sometimes can be the most difficult thing. It's easy to present the gospel to someone we don't know. They don't know our deficiencies or our weaknesses. They don't know us. Um, we don't have to really worry about the repercussions of how they will accept us because we don't have a daily routine that, that, that incorporates them in, uh, in our lives. And so...